Time Out New York, but I'll take the Guinness Book of World Records, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to tell a story that happened to me in uh, 2002. Uh, it was about five in the morning, and uh, I was at one of those shishi bottle service only nightclubs somewhere in Manhattan in the meatpacking district, and I was in a special roped off VIP area within the shishi club, and sitting next to me was Mark Cuban, <laughs> the billionaire. Yeah. B as in boy, illionaire. Uh, yeah, he and I had been hanging out for several hours at this point, and at some time in the night, he leaned over and whispered in my ear, Cambry, when you live in my world, you can do anything you want. Oh my God, gross. Did he say that out loud? <laughs> Ew, kind of scary too, but also, is that, is that true? Because... <laughs> Um, maybe I could have like, I don't know, 1% of that? <laughs> or even 0.1% would probably be fine. I don't know, who had time for math? This was very surreal. I was really overwhelmed. I excused myself to go to the washroom and I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, Cambry, oh my God, you made it. You made it, you made it. You are never ever gonna live in a tin shed again. <laughs> Because that's how I'd grown up. Me, my parents, and my brother, we all lived under one roof in a hot tin shed with no running water, no electricity, no plumbing. No plumbing! And there is a woman outside the bathroom door. She's going to give me a mint if I want one. I didn't even want one, but she's there. It's a little different, you know, than my mom who would hand me a flashlight and tell me to look for snakes before I use the outhouse. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this is a remarkable reversal of fortune. Yeah, well, and uh, now, truth, but in, uh, we did actually have a trailer at one point, but I guess my parents stopped paying the bills. I don't know, two guys showed up with a truck, put my childhood home on wheels, and rolled it out of there. Our trailer was repossessed. Yeah, one kid, he um, called me trailer trash one time, and I was like, I don't live in a trailer. It's true. <laughs> That is the true statement. I was a little spin doctor. Uh, now, the, even living in squalor, in the middle of the woods, whatever, I always knew, though, that one day I was going to grow up, move to New York City, and be in showbiz. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no one, thankfully, told that little kid uh, that the best chance she had of being on TV was like an episode of Cops. <laughs> yeah, that was my family. Um, the, my episode happened, and it would have been dubbed a very special episode. I, it was the uh, summer before my senior year in high school. My dad actually held me and my mom hostage. He violently attacked her. I intervened in the attack. I saved my mom's life, and my whole life turned upside down, and it was very traumatic. And um, I, I'm sure I had PTSD, but geez, we didn't have electricity. You think I got uh, therapy? No, of course not. So, you know, my, and also, Nothing happened to my dad because 80s, Texas, he just got probation. So he was free to stalk us, and he did. He stalked us, and so my senior year of high school, I went into hiding, and I had these terrible, terrible nightmares, and I was just trying to get out of this situation. And so um, the way to get out of my dad's world um, was to get married. So while I was a senior in high school, 17 years old, I married a 23-year-old man in the U.S. Navy. And my mom, she signed the permission slip like I was going on a field trip, you know. <laughs> Just like a really long, important field trip. <laughs> well, now, in my mom's defense, uh, the movie Top Gun had just come out. <laughs> and he worked on F-14 Tomcats. So really, it, it was patriotism. <laughs> So she shipped me off. <laughs> uh, when I got out of high school and he got out of the Navy, we moved to his hometown, which was in Akron, Ohio. Now, this was in the early 90s, so the internet didn't exist. And uh, I took his last name and moved across the country. It was like basically a hillbilly witness protection program. <laughs> like, I, Camry Cruz of the past did not exist. I had this whole new life, and these poor kids today, they don't know what that's like to just be able to abandon your current life and just start a whole new family. And I did. And, uh, you know, it wasn't quite New York City, and it wasn't showbiz, 
But in Akron, I did get the best paying acting job I have ever had to date, ever. You know what the role was? Assistant vice president of a bank. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I acted like it. And I didn't go to college, I didn't deserve this job. But worse, I was collecting commercial loans, like million dollar loans. I was a bill collector, I hated bill collectors. What was I doing? So I was like, nope, I've gotta, I, I gotta escape Rob's world and I've gotta make it to New York City in showbiz. And I, so I moved without a job, without anything. And that's where I met Mark Cuban the way I meet everyone I know at a show. <laughs> like, I don't know, how else do you meet people? I don't know. Well, I guess now the internet exists, like I said. You know. um, but so yeah, I met him at a show, and now it's like six in the morning, and because he's a billionaire, I guess he just paid everyone to stay late? I don't know, break the laws, stay open. He wanted to keep the party going, move to the next location. I'm like, no, 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 I, I actually have to, you know, go to work, <laughs> I have a job. But I didn't tell him my day job, which was at a law firm. I just told him, I actually have to fly out to a private island on the British Virgin Islands. This was also not a lie, like the whole trailer, to, I didn't live in a trailer. Well, I did have a gig on, uh, on a private island in the British Virgin Islands. It was um, called Marina K, in real life is what it's called. But for several months out of the year, Jose Cuervo, leased it and turned it into the Cuervo Nation. <laughs> and I was their ambassador. <laughs> I was the ambassador. And we had, a, we had a flag. We pledged allegiance to the Cuervo Nation. And we petitioned the United Nations to let us become a member. <laughs> they said no. I don't know why, but I, yeah, I used to be like, oh, did pledging allegiance, I mean, is that like something you can do? Do I relinquish my American citizenship? And now I'm like, hey, do you remember that time I relinquished my citizenship? Can I go back to the Cuervo Nation, please, right now, now? Um, but the Cuervo Nation was only a, like six acres big. It was a little teeny thing. You could swim around it in less than 10 minutes. Um, there were, there could only be 16 people at a time, like, the groundskeeper and me, and then the rest of them were prize winners. And to get there, you had to take a plane to a puddle jumper to two separate ferries. It was like an Agatha Christie murder mystery scenario <laughs> situation. And so I got to the Cuervo Nation. It's this beautiful place without televisions or telephones. And you know, I used to bathe in a horse trough and use the same bath water as my family. We had to share bath water. And now I've got this private villa and an outdoor shower. I had made it, I had made it. Now, later the prize winners are there and the bartender, he says, hey Cambry, it's like two in the morning, we're playing a fierce game of butt darts, which if you haven't heard, is very fun. You just basically squeeze something in your butt cheeks and try to land it in a, st in a stein. <laughs> you know, butt darts. <laughs> we're playing butt darts. And the phone is for me, the telephone, phone. And all the prize winners look at me like, excuse me, you said we couldn't phone home and we were on this stranded island forced to drink Jose Cuervo. And I'm like, no, there's no phones here. And that's when we all kind of had a, uh-oh, you don't get a call at two in the morning on the Cuervo Nation because something good has happened. And indeed, nothing good had happened. My dad had tried to kill someone again. And this time it was much more severe. She lived, thankfully. There would be consequences. Uh, and I had to fly back to New York City and face my real world. I decided not to get back in touch with Mark Cuban. I just kind of ghosted him, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, where are you? I think we're Facebook friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I didn't belong in Mark's world, and I didn't belong in this Jose Cuervo, she, she, uh, who, who was that? I wasn't in Rob's world anymore. This is, this was my life, and all that PTSD and all those dreams, they came back, like, right away. And you do not have to be a psychologist to figure out what my dreams meant. They were always the same. Uh, I had killed someone, and I had hidden the body in the floorboards, and now the cops were onto me. They were on my trail and I was running from them just terrified that they were gonna discover my truth. And the, the amount of guilt and oh, the shame, 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 it just, 
it overwhelmed me and it creeped into my dreams. And this time though, I wasn't gonna run. Like I had made, I was in New York City in showbiz-ish. I didn't wanna run away anymore. And also the internet existed, so I couldn't start a whole new family and a whole new life across the, the world. Thanks, Obama or whoever it was. Who created the internet? Al Gore. <laughs> so I was stuck here, but I, I was like, you know what? Instead of running, let me try something different. Let me just tell the truth and let me just pull up the floorboards and show everybody this is the dead body I've been keeping. These are all my secrets. And I just laid it bare. And that's how I got into stand-up comedy because I really needed therapy. And that's all this is. <laughs> that's all this is. I am, oh, and you're my psychologist, by the way. I didn't, I forgot to tell you that in the beginning. Uh, yeah, and then I also found my people through stand-up comedy because, I mean, Really, what is stand-up comedy but the trailer park of the arts world, so. <laughs> uh, and uh, telling the truth, I immediate, it's so cliche. The truth sets you free. It sets you free. I was free. And immediately, I just felt more in my own skin, in my own world and stuff. And uh, I was at Joe's Pub telling a story with Molly Ringwald on the bill. She was sitting next to me. And Kathleen Turner was in the audience. And afterwards, I'm sharing stories and swapping stories with Molly Ringwald. And Kathleen Turner locks eyes with me. And she beelines over. And she goes, Cambry, I liked that. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. And she was going to be on the show in a couple of months. And, and she wanted my advice. And we're commiserating. And, and it didn't feel weird. I didn't feel like an imposter. I wasn't acting like anything else. It, she was a colleague. Sure, she's rich and famous and everything, but I felt like I belonged. I didn't have to run to the bathroom and be like, oh my God. Uh, I was, I fit. And it felt right for the first time. And then um, uh, I went to go see her perform and she sang a song and I was in the front row. Really, I'm sure she couldn't see me because the lights were bright and everything, but I swear she was singing right to me when she was talking about how all the roads and all the ups and downs and all the bad and the good, I wouldn't change a thing because all these roads, they led me here to you. And I was like, to me. <laughs> <laughs> but it also kind of clicked for me, you know what, she's right. And that song is right. I wouldn't change a thing. All the ups and downs, the bad, the good, all of it, it, it all led me to finding me and here to you. And you know what? This is my world and I can do anything I want. Thank you. Cambry Cruz, everyone.